Now we come to our keynote speaker. Um, so it is with great uh, pleasure and honor uh, that I uh, introduce the, His uh, Royal Highness uh, Prince Hassan bin Talal. As you know, Prince Hassan has served as Regent of Jordan for for many years and on many occasions, Sharif, and therefore... if you don't mind, I don't need an introduction. I'll introduce myself as we go along. Oh, very good. <laughs> the reason, ladies and gentlemen, why I don't want to introduce myself is that all of you are so important, because Sharif has been pointing out clearly to us what credentials each and every one of us uh, carries, that I feel in this rarefied atmosphere that I have to say that it's not about us, ladies and gentlemen. You know, in the hard work that you have done, it's about millions and millions of victims all over the world. And I want to ask you, maybe by way of at least exercising for one moment, that we recognize how important the work of the International Institute of Higher Studies in Criminal Sciences established in 1972 is, and how important this man, Sharif Basuni, is to this continued effort. His doctor, although he wouldn't tell you, or at least two doctors ago, maybe I think he fired that particular doctor, when advising him on his health, said, Sharif, you have one foot on a banana peel and one foot in the grave. And this guy has done more bypasses than any système routier that I could possibly imagine. So I think that we owe ourselves, we owe the Institute, and we owe its di distinguished director, and we owe the ethos of this meeting, a round of applause. So would you please mind standing up? Would you all stand up? I've been listening keenly to many of the things that have been said, and I want to weave in some commentary into the text that I had uh, originally thought of sharing with you. Yes, I did have the rare privilege of calling on Pope Francis this morning. And yes, I had the rare privilege of recognizing a rare, approachable, sincere, and knowledgeable human being who, when warning us all of the dangers of the culture of indifference, starts with himself. I cannot tell you how moved and inspired I feel. I had the opportunity of saying that I get up every morning not because of a sense of duty. We left all of that behind years ago when we were much younger. Not because I'm an automaton, but because my young grandchildren come to wake me up. And when they bestow on me the greatest gift, which is a beautiful smile, first thing in the morning, I say to myself, you son of a bitch, you have to get on with it. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. When I say that my tiny country has faced decades of war and peace, certainly every decade of my lifetime. And two days ago, I received the first wave of Iraqi Christian 
refugees from Mosul. Imagine 250,000 people got up and moved out of Mosul out of sheer fear. I thank the Coast Guard of Italy and of Syracuse for what you are doing with the Mari Nostrum operation. I feel for you because you are spending from your own resources on looking after people who have been forgotten. I met 332 people, when I say met, sat and talked with them and with their church representatives and with Muslim religious figures. And today they are residing in churches in Mar Elias, in Mar Sherbal. 171 of them are already residing in private houses with Jordanian citizens. The contributions ranged from hundreds of thousands to 10 dinars. Our hearts have gone out yet again to another human disaster. And I thank everyone, in particular Caritas Jordan. I am reminded of my friend, the late Amin Tore Fanfani, who years ago, in 1967, was the first person to extend assistance to the refugees of Palestine. I remember Aurelio Peche of the Academia de Linche who created the Forum Humanum because he, like Pope Francis, recognized the centrality of human dignity. The correlation, ladies and gentlemen, is not between sustainability and triumphalist investment. The correlation has to become between sustainability of objectives which have to be clearly defined and human dignity. The Millennium Development Goals, ladies and gentlemen, do not include the word justice yet. And I presented my resignation to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon through the Deputy Jan Eliasson only a few weeks ago after having presented an action plan for water simply because I felt that our region, West Asia and North Africa, deserve better. No one refers to the fact that 45 million Egyptians in the Delta region of Egypt are going to be flooded by the Mediterranean Sea by 2030. This is why successive meetings, including only a few days ago with the participation of Peter Maurer of the ICRC, are dedicated to understanding the hybrid nature of carrying capacity. We are living in a region, ladies and gentlemen. Said the Secretary General's invitation, we are invited to present our sustainable development goals, and then it is on the 38th floor of the United Nations that we are told that the synergy will develop between the sustainable development goals and the millennium development goals. I think that we need accountability in terms of identifying to all of us, ordinary men and women, how this synergy is achieved. I would hate to think that somebody says nutrition and somebody else says water and somebody else says energy 
And then we discover, as our Egyptian friends would say, Hiakida. It has been decided, so this is how it will be. Where is the causality of prioritization in the multilateral system? If we cannot focus on human dignity. My tiny country was meant to be two and a half million people in 1992. Today we are something between 10 and 11 million people. We are told by Bretton Woods, the World Bank, the IMF, that according to the rules, we are not allowed to talk about refugees, DPs, IDPs, stateless persons, because all of these people are political economy. Peter Sutherland on the Commission for Mobility my colleague has said very elegantly, the mobility stakeholders are on Venus and the national stakeholders are on Mars. So if you want to talk about development, you have to make your choice. And I say to our Arab nation, is it not time that a self-respecting nation and culture recognize the fact that all of these refugees, DPs, IDPs, stateless persons are Arab citizens. We didn't make them Arab citizens. When Winston Churchill in 1946, looking at the ruins of Europe, after the Second European Civil War, the Second World War, and my tiny country, you may have heard of the Arab Legion, fought alongside the Western Allies in two world wars. We're not a Commonwealth country. We didn't back the Axis powers. Of course, my Husseini friends from the famous Palestinian family of Hajj Amin Husseini says, you say you people were lackeys of the British. So I say to them, well, you backed the wrong horse, didn't you? And this takes us back to the crux of the problem. It is the victor who dictates who is within and beyond the law. I know these points are basic to you. I'm not standing up here on a soapbox, but I think it's about time that we recognized, as Gibbon once put it, describing the fall of Greece, that the Greeks wanted everything. They wanted prosperity, a better life, freedom, but when the Greeks got the freedom they wanted, including, including freedom from responsibility, Athens ceased to be free. What accountability does a region which is supposed to take justice seriously and I speak of the Holy Land, where people are taught that justice is a divine endeavor and a human inspiration, where they are taught that they will never be able to escape the repercussions of their sinful deeds, where they are taught that the consequences of their unjust acts will catch up with their souls just as surely as the effects of time will one day leave its indelible effect on their bodies. And before that, they are taught by their parents or their teachers that they are 
in the words of the Bible, to keep justice and do righteousness, for soon salvation will come and deliverance be revealed. What chances do people, whether Arabs of Christian culture or Arabs of Jewish culture, and I studied the Torah at university in the 60s, and I remember learning the three governing words, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, justice, justice you shall pursue. And from the Holy Quran, our Creator Allah seeks to lighten the burden of legislation on you. For man is created weak. What can I say to people who are supposed to take justice seriously when from 1967, when I returned from university to build refugee camps, the only justice we have seen is at the end of a gun. Some of you have spoken about international corporations. I think it was you, Sharif. And none of you have spoken about the military-industrial complex. Ike did that for us in 1959 in his famous speech. And I want to say today that coming from the Levant, the wombs of civilization. Yesterday it was Babylon. Today it's Nineveh. The Babylonians and the Assyrians. Their antiquities are stolen on a regular basis. We have eyes in the sky and we see the shipments, not of weapons, but of holy cities being exported to neighboring countries and to world-class museums. I ask you, as embedded scholars, not embedded journalists, people of thought, of resources, of libraries, of memories. Is it possible for us to recall in Syracuse, in Sicily, in Puglia, the ethic, the ethic of Frederick Hohenstaufen, who came to our part of the world in the 12th century and said in beautiful Arabic, When you, Jews, Christians, and Muslims of Arab culture, come to my country, I don't think the concept of country was there, was it, Sharif? You were around in 1648, as you keep reminding us. <laughs> I want to say that the problem today is not the psychopathology of nationalism created in 1648, the problem is that we are living in 2014, a proto-Westphalian period. It's all about me, me, me. I am important because I belong to this tribe, or to that clan, or that corporation, or this institution, or that uniform, with all due respect to the men in uniform. I want to say that Syria could have benefited from an understanding of the Mare Nostrum as that Mare Nostrum that Aurelio Pece spoke about all those years, years ago. Not only a Western Mediterranean, but an Eastern Mediterranean as well. In 1943, to my Iranian friends, I remind you,
that Stalin occupied Tehran. Roosevelt and Churchill said to him, I'm narrating the subscript, what do you want with Iran? Have Eastern Europe instead. I can't read Mr. Putin's mind any more than any of you can, I suppose. But I wonder whether this marchandise characterized by the First World War Cabinet Diaries in 1918. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll discuss Armenia tomorrow after tea, if we have time, says Lord Kitchener. And maybe we can take Georgia just before supper. Isn't it time that we recognize, as I said to the French ambassador in the Security Council, when we invited them all to dinner at Zaid Ra'ad's house. He said, I want you to know, you're talking about French sense of humor. There are two sides to every sense of humor. Depends who is laughing at whom. He said, we were marching, meaning General Goro, on behalf of colonial France, rejected on the ground in Silesia because my great uncle, Faisal I, did not allow the movement of troops to Silesia, hence the Turks besting the French army. Goro comes vengefully, vengefully to Damascus. We were marking, marching to Damascus, he says, because a third party pointing at the British ambassador promised it to you and to us. I said, I know something about who the us were. We were promised independence for an Arab state built on pluralism and recognition of the other. And had Woodrow Wilson survived, we probably would have got closer to that dream. Every pocket handkerchief size state in our region, in all our region, with all due respect, worries about security issues. We were marching, ladies and gentlemen, for self-determination for the Arabs. We were not marching to put Damascus on the map after Morocco and Algeria as a French possession. Of course, if the Axis powers of one had won, we would probably be an Italian colony by now, so maybe I should have learned Italian some time ago. But that is history with hindsight. I learned Latin, at least. Many of you, I think, don't speak Latin, so at least I did something in that direction. It's not about me, I have to remind myself. I have to say that it's about regional commons. It's about the better future for the greatest number of people. You talk about sovereignty. Once upon a time, I was visited by a delegation of American congressmen, senators, and they said, from here, we're going to see Menachem Begin. And why are you so worried about Jerusalem? Sovereignty is God's, they said. I said, when you see Menachem Begin, please ask him, how do we share in the one God? Look at the tens of thousands of dunams that are being appropriated in greater Jerusalem as we speak. Look at the realities in the Eastern Mediterranean. I don't want to speak here about strategic waterways and Hormuz, Babel Mendeb. I want to talk about 83,000 square kilometers of gas in the Eastern Mediterranean. Don't tell me this had nothing to do 
with the conflict with Gaza, which since 1977, since the early days of the Likud, has not changed in terms of the basic perception. Let the future of the Palestinian territories, an Israeli pundit says, be created in eight new emirates. Not emirs of the Daesh kind, I suppose, yet, but emirs of Bethlehem, Tulkaram, Jenin, etc., etc. And let the state, with the credentials of the fighting that has been going on between both parties, both of them violating international law, be a fact that we place on the map of Middle East politics. I came here to talk about policy. When I visited the Balkans with Yossi Sarid, Minister of Education at the time, and by the way, I had to wait respectfully while the cavalcade of Shimon Perez drove out of the Vatican today, I have to speak very carefully because I am told that he may be a consensus prime minister tomorrow. After all, being president at 90 is also something that is achievable. I want to say that the future is one where the acquisition of territory by war is acceptable. Contrary to what Mr. Obama said yesterday, they have to realize, he said in Tallinn, that the acquisition of territory by war is not acceptable, and we, NATO, are there to write the balance. When I went to Sarajevo, I had the chutzpah, as did Ishaq Rabin and my late brother King Hussein, to put on those planes. Jewish, forgive me, Israeli, Jordanian assistance to the Muslims of Bodnia. And the reverse, Jordanian, Israeli assistance to the Muslims of Bodnia. And who were the Muslims of Bosnia looking to, with the wink and the nod from the White House of that time, the arrival of the Mujahideen? Some of us would say that maybe if Russia had stayed in Afghanistan, we wouldn't be in this mess anyway. You can blame it all on me, it doesn't really matter. I couldn't care less, quite honestly. <laughs> because I am too hurt with the truths that I have lived to care very much. Is justice and the goddess Astraea, the blind goddess, realizable? She has left us apparently and gone into the toposphere or something, I don't know. We're still waiting her, for her to come back with her scales. Is it realizable in our time? Or are the enemies of today the friends of tomorrow? I don't know what Bashar al-Assad is thinking now. I don't know if he's thinking about the fact that it was an enormity of his to release thousands of psychopaths from his jails so that they could be the nucleus of Daesh. And you have seen what they have achieved in Raqqa airport. Will they go on to achieve something equally horrific in their resort tomorrow? I cannot believe that the Islamic Republic of Iran, that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, that any of the countries of the region are happy with what is happening. 
but to be unhappy with what is happening is to join the ranks of millions of people in our part of the world who don't know whether they have a future. To be able to construct a region based on international law is to invite the Congress of Vienna, to invite a Versailles conference, to invite a regional conference with an international presence. I can tell you, when I sat next to the Croat and the Serb and the Muslim Bosnian and the Israeli, and they said to me, please, out of seniority, sit in the center seat, the hot seat. It was the most difficult press conference I have ever had to moderate in my life. None of them wanted to talk to each other or recognize the presence of the other. And I am not one of those who believe that diplomacy should continue to be a dying art. I don't believe that Twitterverse, as in universe, Twitterverse is the job of ambassadors. I think ambassadors, however important they are perceived to be, have to build bridges. I am here to try and build bridges with you by saying, please do not judge us, as Harvard University has recently proclaimed, us, the failed and failing states of the world, as isomorphic mimicries. How would you like to be an isomorphic mimic, Caliph Ibrahim? Remember, Mosul today, Aleppo tomorrow. If we just sit and watch and wait. We've had 70 plus years of bad governance in our region. The West Asia, North Africa region. It's easy to dismiss groups as being evil. But I think what is important here is to remember the fact that when I was working, for me at least, with Cardinal Avaristo Arens in Sao Paulo in the 1970s with three children, my colleague from the Club of Rome might remember, I bored you with all these facts because I tried to bring humanitarian considerations into the Club of Rome. If Sharif Basuni has, as I'm sure he has, read the Meadows report, we wouldn't have needed so many references to the dying and the starving. It is the carrying capacity of this world that is being contested by those who continue to contribute to the population bomb. Nobody is prepared to say enough. Let's have healthy children. Because they think that their children are going to be the firewood of the next war. We objected to the isms of the so-called ideologues because we felt there was nothing, as I said yesterday publicly, these Daesh incidents and horrors are against religion, against humanity, and against civilization. And I am appalled and ashamed by how few Arab writers have said this. If we want justice, then we should seek it. I'd like to ask you that when you conduct an, an, an examination of extremism during these conversations, maybe you can explain to yourself that the child who sees his or her parents slaughtered in front of him or her may grow up to be a suicide bomb. But can you explain to me what university graduates from all over the world are doing 
coming to our part of the world to announce on YouTube with their blood-stained hands, congratulate me, I have killed a fellow human being. Is that the education that we are seeking? I want to know if security is well defined in today's world. Security means weapons of mass destruction. That is basic security. Security means war on terror. That is current security. But what about human security? What about the importance of acknowledging the call that I, among many others, made with Madeleine Albright when she headed the commission quite recently, calling for justice, making the law work for everyone. I repeated this call in front of and with the participation of 100,000 signatories in the West Asia North Africa Forum. Am I missing something? I don't know. <laughs> in the West Asia North Africa Forum only a few weeks ago. I don't know whether and when security will be recognized in terms of people being the vector of stability or instability. I'm going to speak at the NATO Defense College next week, so I'm coming back again, and I want to talk about waging peace not waging war. I want to ask if international law can be broadened to include the law of peace, a set of laws directed, directly related to human welfare. In every aspect, you talked about the people of Yemen. Let me remind you, my brother, that half of the people of Yemen are affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. If you are trying to land in a Jordanian airliner in Sana'a Airport, at 28,000 feet you can see the drone. We are losing our young population to extremism as we speak. And when we speak of money, I want to ask, when will the Arab world wake up to its responsibilities and make zakat a reality. A-L-M-S, not A-R-M-S. Universal zakat. 70% of the world's refugees are Muslims. What are we Muslims doing about it? Islamic banking. Islamic bonds. I don't know about banking, and I certainly don't know anything about Islamic banking. And those who have tried to explain it to me are very rich people who I don't trust anyway. Well, what about institutional self-determination based on altruism and based on the word and the spirit of Islam? As we talk about waging peace, what better place to start, as Peter Maurer and President Buchler of Switzerland, of the Swiss Federation, have recently put it, what better place to start than the Fourth Geneva Convention? If we were to apply the rulings of the Geneva Convention to the recent conflict in Gaza, I would like to remind you that the bombardment of innocent civilians by either side, as I have said earlier, is in direct violation of the principles that were agreed upon in 1949. I don't want to transgress on your very difficult mandate, sir, but I wish you every success because no conflict plays out all by its own. It's always important to look at the historical context. Take the example of the occupied territories 
Resolution 242, adopted by the UN Security Council, clearly declares the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. Speaking of Resolution 242, allow me to tell you an anecdote. Many years ago, Margaret Thatcher happened to call my late brother King Hussein as he was dining in my house. My brother the king said, I'm eating, speak on the telephone. So I got up to speak on the telephone. Good evening, Prime Minister, I said, and she thought immediately that I was my brother because when Mrs. Thatcher calls the King of Jordan, the King of Jordan comes to the telephone. Now, being his brother, surprise, surprise, I had rather a similar voice. So I heard this voice coming down the other end of the line saying, non-acquisition of territory by war, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war and the right to self-determination. I couldn't help myself, and I said to her, Madam Prime Minister, why do the sheep bells of the Falklands ring louder than the church bells of Jerusalem? And she said, well, you know how it is. <laughs> and I said, yes, unfortunately I do. And I reminded her many times of that story. In addition to Resolution 242, there have been a number of articles and rulings that prohibit settlement on territory that has been occupied by war. And these have been issued by institutions such as the UN Commission on Human Rights, ECOSOC, the International Court of Justice. After all, ICJ also found that the construction of the wall built by Israel in the OPT was contrary to international law. And all of this brings up the question, when we devote reels upon reels of newsprint and hours upon hours of television time to discussing the conflict in Gaza, why can't we spend a few minutes discussing the illegality of these actions and the layers of historic illegality that provide their context? There's broad academic consensus that the 2003 attack on Iraq by US, UK, and coalition forces breached international law. Articles 2 and 39 of the UN Charter, to which the Allied forces are party, bans the use of force by states, except in specific circumstances, and vests the Security Council as the only organization able to rule on the illegality of war. I think, sir, if you become the next Secretary General, you don't want me as a friend. <laughs> we can ponder that, ponder that later. In addition, many experts, some of you are here today, have identified potential violations of the Geneva Conventions by the US and the UK in its role as an occupying power. I am not blind to the complexities and nuances of war, but I am also a pragmatist. How can we convince the people of war-ravaged states to believe in the rule of law when the power holders so flagrantly opt in and out of its most basic precepts? Is it too much, Sharif, to aspire in a conference like this to a template of hope which we construct together to address the power holders to lead by example, to be the most scrupulous adherents, the scrup most scrupulous adherents, I'm having the same problem as you did with extremism, scrupulous adherents of the very values that they preach. You'll be happy to know that I only want to conclude my remarks by suggesting the bottom line is, can we prepare for the expected? In West Asia and North Africa, we have borne witness to too many haphazard, ad hoc, unplanned, post-conflict reconstruction processes. We've seen emergency report efforts that are dressed up as sustainable development plans designed to bolster Resilience, thank you very much. 
Resilience, according to the Copenhagen, uh, forgive me, the Stockholm center of that name, is eco-social. Environmental, but eco-social. The IUCN, let's hear one good thing that the Arabs have done, have adopted the word hema, which is the social, the human, and the physical environment. But these initiatives do little to further psychosocial resilience at an individual level. It is only good bedside manner that can do that. Good governance, the element of trust. The other day when we produced, Arab youth produced the social charter after three years of hard work, the first line, and I chair the Arab Thought Forum, was proscribe all forms of discrimination. And the Tunisian looked at me and he said, I don't know much about you, but at least I know you're clean. That was the greatest medal I have ever worn on my chest. Can we prepare for the expected when it comes to Syria? We know that the conflict will end, and we hope that people will return to their communities, but we know, don't know when this peace will unfold or, for that matter, what this peace will look like. We know it will happen at some point. So why are we not doing more to prepare for such a peace? My friend at the Oxford Research Group, Professor Roger Zetter, asked the following question. There are three million so-called Syrian refugees. Should we stick them with the label refugees and condemn them to what he calls an institutionalized world of NGOs, intergovernmental agencies, and governments? I would like to suggest to you that we should talk to the displaced people about their vision for a just post-conflict Syria. I wonder whether this talk can take place in time. The longest distance in the world, ladies and gentlemen, is from here to here and back. Experts visit my country every day, practically, to spend three hours in Jordan, one hour over lunch with their constituency, journalists, businessmen, whatever it may be. One hour in calling on the high ups, and one hour in creating an impression of declaring what they've seen in a statement that they've written before they left their home countries. We need to prepare for rather than wait and react to conversations about transitional justice. I'll be the first to admit that our region has little experience in transitional justice mechanisms. And that's why I think that the Visegrad Four should have been represented in this meeting. Czechia, Hungary, Poland have an outstanding contribution to make. People in need, I don't know sir, if, you, if people in need work in your country, Pax Christi, these are the people who understand, speak the dialect, even better than our bureaucrats. Let's not turn these millions of people into, there are, they are already cannon fodder, but into munitions for opinionated and opportunistic politics. I've heard a lot about other peace processes, Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, different regimes. South Asia maybe one day will become what it was meant to be, a federation of regions. And I don't know whether one can take a blueprint from one region to another. All I know is that you have to help us to help ourselves. We have a spice route, we have a silk route, we have routes of pilgrimages, 
What about a template of hope from Syracuse talking of a root of creative ideas? Thank you for your patience.